you blog? Do you have an eBay star? Have you written reviews? Have you clicked on an ad while viewing an interactive map? If so, all reports suggest that you're part of what is being called Web 2.0. And without even a word about Web 2.1, 2.5, we're already talking about Web 3.0, or what Web 3.0 will be. One definition from the Wikipedia discussion tab calls Web 1.0 the readable phase of the World Wide Web. Static, flat data. Web 2.0, the writable phase, interactive data, social networking. Web 3.0, the executable phase, dynamic applications, interactive services, machines talking to machines. Think TiVo, recording programs based on preferences. Maybe your machine can search the web and read what it finds to you. Maybe the machine can seek out that college book list, find used copies at a low price, pay for them and have them shipped to you. What's to come in the foreseeable future? I'm Michael Singer here to talk about Web 2.0 and Web 3.0. I have some distinguished guests here in the studio. Uh, from IBM, I have David Barnes. And from Stevens Institute, I have Michael Zermulin. And on the phone with us today, uh, from New Venture Partners, I have Steven Sokoloff. Uh, as far as defining this 3.0 world, uh, a lot of times you'll hear the semantic web, and people are saying the semantic web equals web 3.0. Uh, it's machine-to-machine -machine communication. Uh, David, I'm going to turn to you first and help us with what is this semantic web and uh, you know how does it work? Uh, the idea, in fact, I think Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, might have been one of the first ones to really get focused on that. And the idea is, is that the web is a huge database. And we should be able to get the data from anywhere, and that's the way we approach it. But to do that, a lot of people imply that it's going to take a special way of doing it. You'll use RDF, a description format, to define the data, etc. And right now, things are moving so fast, I don't have time to do that. And I don't see the immediate business value. I believe, and what we're seeing, like Amazon, is they put an API in front of their data. It says, you can get to my data, but I need some control. I don't want to open up everything to you. Right. Um, there's a site called Programmable Web right now. There are, as of last night, 511 APIs from different companies so you can get to their data. And people on the web, on the Programmable Web, about 2,400 mashups are out there where people are taking these things and mashing them together. Kapow! Uh, dapper, they'll scrape pages, and that sounds simplistic, but they'll scrape the pages, get the information, some sophisticated software underneath it, and they'll let me get to the information. So I think that approach will evolve to getting the information from the web, but until you give me a business reason why I should structure things that way, uh, I'm going to continue on getting the most business value for the buck, and we'll work on that as it becomes valuable. Now, who's liable once that information is grabbed and uh, mashed? <coughs> the answer is nobody knows. Um, some people will say if it's on the web, it's free. One of the um, things about Web 2.0 that O'Reilly defined is that we're moving from uh, some ri all rights reserved to some rights reserved. Um, YouTube's had its lawsuits, and some come and some go. And so nobody really knows the answer. Um, some people think if I read it, the information's mine, but if I scrape it, it's not. Mm -hmm. So the answer has yet to be determined. People like Amazon said, we want you to get our information because ultimately we believe it'll come back to the Amazon site. So they free the information. And I think you just gave an example of someone else that has done essentially the same thing. That's okay. true. Uh, Bearing Point uh, took their information management practice and put their entire methodology on a site, openmethodology.org. They created a foundation around that very similar to the Apache Foundation that defined the popular web server. And they made it open in the public domain and under a Creative Commons license. So people can go in, they can read this stuff, it's on the wiki platform, they can edit it. And you would expect that the um, methodology for a consulting company is their secret sauce that they want to keep to themselves. So it's a bit confounding that they decided to open this up to the outside world and allow everyone, even their competitors, to look at it and uh, maybe even to change bits of it. But in the end, I believe they expect that their customers, if they have a better understanding of what it is that they do, will engage them because they know that the company that created the intellectual property has a good understanding of how to use it. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Now, uh, Michael, you had mentioned that Basecamp is a good example of Web 2.0 capability right now. Lots of people using it, lots of information uh, that's shared out there. Now, what's the next step after that? I think the next step is to take isolated applications, and Basecamp is a very good project management application where we can have schedules, we can have calendars, we can have collaborative spaces, and integrate them into our business processes and figure out how we can leverage this new technology to make our businesses perform better and to get the right work to the right people. And an example, a very recent example, is that with the disappearance of Steve Fawcett, uh, Google has provided imagery of the area where Steve Fawcett disappeared, and Amazon, through a Mechanical Turk website, is asking people to look at parts of these images and to determine whether there's something suspicious there or not, and whether there sh uh, should be any search going on there. And they've uh, farmed that out to 30 to 40,000 people in a process that's called crowdsourcing. So similar mechanisms we could employ within organizations to distribute work, to allocate work that goes beyond the traditional organization chart where you have reporting structures and distribution structures. And Web 2.0 technology is what enables that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Stephen, how long before uh, money, real money is made on Web 3.0 technology? That's a good question. We're beginning to see some pretty interesting economics um, enabled. I'd say it's a little early to tell in terms of, or we haven't seen real money being made yet, except for some leading edge folks like YouTube who got acquired by Google seeing that vision. Uh, but clearly we're seeing, you know, a huge numbers of people immersing themselves in Second Life and creating economies there. We're seeing enterprises invest more and more in mobile services. We're seeing given what I do, where we're looking at corporate technology spin-outs, uh, we're seeing um, correlation with that, companies using the web to help with innovation. David, let me close with you. Uh, if I look at the calendar and say what's going to be different in 2008, what's going to be different in 2010 from a web 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 perspective, uh, kind of lay it out for me with some timelines and some milestones. Okay. The first thing I would say is that people are going to finally get by the, the version of itis that I had mentioned before. But right now I believe that companies are going to have to learn how to unlock their data and get over the fear of 40 years of locking the computer room and, and no one gets to my information to unlocking my information. We've got to find out why, what's the value of it. And we'll call them widgets, if you will that I can put on a web page, mash together, they'll become aware of each other after a while, so when I click on a customer, the map information comes up already. We're doing that with some customers. And then they'll become more aware, so I won't have to wire them together. I'll essentially have some of what people would call Web 3.0 applications, working with applications. And we'll be able to scrape the information one way or another, but it's so much about the innovation. And it took a while for us to get a service-oriented architecture that we all know of. This is the next step. It's the evolution, right? Now I'm taking it instead of machine to machine, machine to user. And everyone that uses it comes up with a new idea. And the more people that use it, the better it gets. And the innovation is coming from the web to the companies, not from the companies out to the web. And so uh, honestly, three, four years from now, I think we're all going to be happily amazed at all of the new things that come. And they're centered around us individuals, too. So we're, we benefit. All of us benefit. We already are. I, I, I know of some banking applications out there right now where I can lend money to you and you can lend money to me. I can lend money to someone in a third world country that wants to be able to build a new on, a, enterprise, an entrepreneur, and that person benefits, and I get my money back. Now, the banking industry's got to look at that and say, wow, how are we going to approach that? And ultimately, they're going to have to do something to be as good. Right. And we're going to benefit. They'll still get a business model around it. But it's really for us, you know, it empowers us as individuals out on the web, and that's great. That's a great example. Okay, well, I would very much like to thank you, David. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Stephen, for being here with us today to discuss Web 2.0, 3.0, and beyond.